Alexander Amora Crivelente, Junior Researcher at SES, the Center for Social Studies in Coimbra, Portugal. And I'm Andreas Marazis, Researcher and Project Manager at the European Neighborhood Council. And together, we are hosting the Mediatized EU podcast series. Today's launch discussion is the first of a series of podcasts dedicated to a four-year-long EU-funded project called Mediatized EU with the aim to shed light and communicate the findings and recommendations to a broader audience. The first introductory recording will help our audience, policymakers, experts, journalists, and ordinary people, understand the project's rationale, objectives, and especially the methodological approach that we will follow throughout the project's lifespan. But let's start with the basics. What is the Meditized EU project all about? I'll try to give you a brief overview of the Mediatized EU project. Uh, the project studies how the media discourses are constructed to foster or hamper the European project and how they resonate among the public by focusing on the elite media public triangle. We believe it is crucial to review the, the, to review the specifics of such mediatization uh, of political discourses on Europeanization across Europe namely the so-called old and new European and Eastern partnership countries. We take a comprehensive mixed methods approach with qualitative, quantitative and deliberative research components. We integrate desk research to review the transformations of media discourses since the start of the 21st century, uh, content analysis and critical discourse analysis of the current media discourses, in-depth interviews with political and media elites, nationwide uh, representative service of the population, and finally, deliberative discussions with relevant publics in the target countries. The project will provide a cross-country comparative analysis of seven target countries, Ireland, Belgium, Portugal, Estonia, Hungary, Spain, and Georgia, as well as develop policy recommendations for national and EU policymakers. Mediatized EU is a consortium of seven institutions from, from the target countries. Antonio de Nebria University from Spain, Taltec Law School of the Italian University of Technology, Estonia, the Center, for, the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra, Portugal, the European Neighborhood Council from, from Belgium, the Dublin City University from Ireland, Center for Social Sciences from Georgia, and Corvinus University of Budapest, Hungary. The project is funded by the European Union's uh, H2010-2020 Research and Innovation Program, and it is uh, its duration spans from January 2021 to December 2014. So, for whoever wants to find out more about the project and the people behind it, I strongly recommend you to visit our website, mediatize.eu. Uh, subscribe, of course, to our newsletter, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter for updates and news. Now, following my uh, colleague's uh, excellent and brief introduction to the world of Mediatized EU, I think it's uh, time to get down to the nitty gritty part of today's podcast. And for that, we are very happy and privileged to have with us, only virtually, unfortunately, one of the masterminds behind this project and certainly a key person when it comes to the methodological approach that this project follows. Dr. Lika Cilaje, who is based in uh, uh, Georgia, is the executive director of the Center for Social Sciences and Associate Professor of Sociology at Tbilisi State University. Since 2011, her empirical research has focused on political and popular discourses on Europeanization, as well as the impact of Europeanization on the perception of national identity. Lika, greetings from Copenhagen and Coimbra, and welcome to the Mediatized EU podcast series. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, Moira, for the invitation. Thank you for um, being eager to discuss these issues and especially to provide this viewpoint, our viewpoint to, uh, to the wider audience. Uh, I, try, I will try to be as clear, not really technical, and as, uh, let's say, as detailed as possible <laughs> in the very brief time that is uh, assigned to our podcast. So yes, I will be glad to take your questions. Thank you. Lika, welcome from my side as well. It is great to see you. Allow me to start by asking the following. We are in the 12th month of the project. One year later, uh, what did the mediatized EU partners have been up to research-wise? What is the first task? Or can you please guide us through the initial research steps of the project and, um, and what the research desk research is focused on? Uh, sure. 
Uh, you have already listed all the stages of research, but I will try to um, provide a more detailed analysis, maybe, or a discussion of each step. Um, so as you have already said, it's a mixed method approach uniting qualitative, quantitative, and deliberative research designs. And uh, probably the qualitative part is the most comprehensive part because it's, uh, it started uh, with um, the desk research, which we have already completed. And now we are doing where it's a second phase of analysis and we are doing media analysis. And this is the analysis of the ongoing current media discourses on European organization and we are targeting various media outlets uh, from tradition uh, both traditional and new and I will come back to this question a bit later and then we will next step will be uh, for us to uh, um, uh, conduct in-depth interviews with uh, political and media elites from the target countries, seven target countries. And here uh, uh, we are going to integrate an innovative approach uh, with an in-depth interviews. I mean, Q analysis. Why is it innovative? Because um, although we have already used it in the former Europeanization research in Georgia back in 2018, 1820, uh, Yes, um, it turned out very useful in um, providing uh, a rather comprehensive and also in-depth analysis of uh, Europeanization discourses because Q methodology analyzes discourses quantitatively while in-depth interview analyzes them qualitatively. So we are combining this qualitative and quantitative approaches within the qualitative research design. Uh, so it, I, I think it would be one of the most interesting parts in our research. And then, then our qualitative part is completed and we are moving to the quantitative one, which implies the nationwide representative surveys with a population in the seven target countries to basically look at how the uh, pol pol political media discourses are reflected in their perceptions of Europeanization and how they are circulated among the public. And then after this quantitative research phase is already completed, we have the deliberative discussions with a wider or audience in the target countries, which uh, I would call um, kind of inter intermediary stage between research and dissemination, because we both get the feedback on our research findings, preliminary findings, and also uh, uh, provide uh, the information about the project to our to the wider public in our countries. So it will be also the very first stage of a public dissemination of our findings. And then the last uh, stage, which is also very important and probably, probably the most important one for the decision makers, both in our countries and at the EU level, will be the production of policy papers where we, uh, based on our uh, research evidence, we will provide particular recommendations uh, uh, how to, uh, let's say, guide the Europeanization discourses and how to help uh, foster the Europeanization project um, in our countries. And that would be recommendations at two levels, as I already said, for the national governments and for EU representatives. That is basically what we are going to do. And it's rather comprehensive. It's rather complex. And at the moment, as we, uh, I have already said, we already completed the desk research phase. We already submitted the um, deliverable to the European a commission. And um, that was a very interesting because I'm familiar, I edited myself all the reports, I'm familiar with all the reports from all the countries and very comprehensive and interesting analysis of the former 20 years, like the coverage of the state of the art starting from the Eastern enlargement in 2003 until today, and basically focusing on the important phases in the uh, lifespan of the European Union and beyond with, uh, the, uh, as I said, 2003 uh, uh, for Eastern enlargement wave, and then, um, then the uh, economic crisis uh, from 2007-8, and then the migration crisis of 2014-16, approximately, and now the COVID crisis. And how do you, all these events or crises have affected Europeanization discourses? Um, 
um, how these discourses have transformed in, in the course of various stages and what we have at the moment, because this creates the basis for our media analysis and indeed our main framework, like let's say coding scheme, our code book uh, is based largely on the uh, uh, analysis of the um, former stage like desk research uh, where we have already uh, overviewed the state of the arts and base our discourses because discourse is basically the unit of our analysis in the course of media analysis so we base our media analysis on the former research and we will uh, of course that that will have a continuity because then the desk research and media analysis space will provide the ground for in-depth in interviews with uh, media and political elites and then uh, all of three will provide the ground for the a public opinion survey i will stop here and wait for your next I mean, uh, Lika, you gave us uh, quite a, a detailed like timeline of uh, what has been uh, done so far from uh, all seven partners the desk research and the focus of the desk research and also uh, the next steps uh, after the media analysis now, since we talked a little bit about the media analysis, in the next question, I would like to focus more on like practically what each of the seven partners are doing at the moment, because we might, the audience might hear like uh, uh, keywords like okay, media analysis, code book, this and that, and they don't understand necessarily what is actually happening. So we want the purpose of this podcast at the end of the day is like to break down the technical details and the technical like uh, jargon that we're using in our research and explain what exactly we're doing. So if you can elaborate for a few minutes what is actually happening during the media analysis uh, research process uh, that will lead us to the next phase. Uh, sure. Uh, it's also a very complex stage of analysis itself because uh, despite the fact that it's part of a qualitative research design, we also unite quantitative elements here. Uh, what we are doing here is the combination of quantitative content analysis, qualitative content analysis, and discourse analysis, especially, as you know, critical discourse analysis. Uh, so first of all, we started with a uh, the basic thing, which is usually done in media analysis, we started sampling various media outlets, and this is our minimum requirement is at least six media outlets from each country. And these media outlets include both TV, um, a press, uh, might be printed or online, and also certain social media like uh, um, blocks uh, which might be related to certain media outlets or might be kind of independent. In some countries, this might be also a, a radio stations. I mean, in some countries, people still listen to the radio, which is not the case in Georgia, but we do not exclude this possibility, of course. So the main criterion for the selection of media was First of all, the popularity of this media outlets, and next uh, uh, was also uh, the positioning of media outlets. Uh, it, this positioning uh, in terms of where we uh, see our position in relation to our country's Europeanization is very important because our research, after all, has to do with the um, discourses on Europeanization. So, uh, but we do not uh, exclude that in different countries, different media media outlets are selected on uh, not exactly the very similar criterion, because in case of Georgia, for example, um, TV uh, uh, channels were selected based on two main criteria, that is pro-governmental and pro-oppositional, and also public versus private. While in case of uh, um, uh, press, whether it's a printed or online, because most of the printed press goes uh, online today. Uh, the criterion was very different because uh, we do not really have pro-governmental or pro-oppositional uh, 
on printed or online press, but we definitely have pro-European and anti-European press. So the uh, selection criterion here was different. So that was the case in other countries as well. So popularity was one thing, another thing was how the Europeanization discourses were structured, another thing might have been uh, the ideological stance. If it matters somewhere, it doesn't mean anything. Ideology doesn't mean anything in Georgia. So it's, it's a bit difficult to explain, but that's the case. I won't go into detail, but in other countries like Portugal or uh, Spain, that might be important. And finally, as I said, public versus uh, private, like public broadcaster versus private TV stations might also be an important uh, um, starting point in our analysis. So we basically select this media outlets and then we, uh, like if I go into technical details, we'll, we start looking at the keywords that we identified for the media analysis. And these keywords, of course, have to do with the, uh, things related to uh, the European Union and Europeanization in our countries. Uh, so uh, based on these keywords, uh, we uh, identify the most important articles, the most important, um, I don't know, uh, things uh, in, uh, let's say, because in, uh, when it comes to the TV uh, channels, we analyze both primetime news and political talk shows. So we need to identify proper topics for our analysis. And these keywords do represent our main, um, uh, let's say, our uh, main instrument for finding this proper themes and reveal these proper topics for analysis. And then, uh, of course, we uh, move on with quantitative content analysis. And as you know, we uh, structure basically based on our research aim and objectives. What we aim to do is to identify the role of pragmatic and identity factors in the Europeanization discourses and how these factors basically structure, uh, 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 push, uh, uh, this Europeanization discourses in a particular way. Uh, what I will briefly define, uh, define what we mean under pragmatic and identity factors. Uh, basically, the, the Europeanization literature provides very good definitions of these factors, and pragmatic factors imply the certain benefits that come from the country's Europeanization, while identity factors have to do with the deeper layers of national and supranational identity, and how all this, uh, there are, or let's say the perceived uh, impact of Europeanization on our national or and supranational identity. So uh, uh, the uh, recent research has shown that, um, and I guess the very recent one uh, checking this up, uh, pragmatic and identity factors and how they work in different countries contexts uh, was uh, implemented back in 2019 so it's rather recent and it showed that these factors do work uh, um, uh, in all 21 countries where uh, it was checked and these were basically European uh, uh, union countries, but also the candidate countries. And these, uh, so these fa factors are functional in uh, both the EU countries and beyond, like say, like aspirant countries, Eastern Partner Partnership countries like Georgia. So we look at how these pragmatic and identity considerations um, encourage uh, the uh, political and popular discourses on uh, Europeanization, what role they, they play in structuring these discourses in a particular way, and uh, how they are uh, um, represented in political uh, popular discourses. Uh, and uh, because uh, we uh, are looking at this very thing, uh, our unit of analysis when it comes to media analysis is not a particular word or theme or concept, but the discourse itself. So that's very important. And that's very um, interesting approach because we take discourse as the unit of analysis and we try to reveal the occurrences of di these discourses. And uh, as a result, what discourses on pragmatic and identity considerations are dominant in uh, in all this, uh, uh, when we look at the uh, elite media and public triangle, so in, in their discourses. And then uh, we are also looking at uh, what discourses are dominant and um, 
uh, we can briefly summarize that uh, using two words. Uh, agenda setting and framing. So what is said and how it is said. Uh, and uh, I guess it's uh, up to your next question, but I will. I think we already go. actually covered the, 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 the final question about like yeah, uh, the so, discourse analysis. So you can maybe su summarize like very briefly because we're almost uh, out of time. Uh, just a uh, few words about the, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. So when it comes to discourse analysis and when, why discourse analysis frame, I guess it's naturally already clear why discourse analysis and not some other approach, and especially why critical discourse analysis, whose funding, founding father is Michel Foucault. And uh, actually, we have adopted his framework of the study of politics and uh, discourse with major five questions uh, that Foucault um, has uh, posed to us. And these questions have to do with uh, uh, what is sayable. So what discourses on Europeanization are actually produced by uh, elite media and public? And uh, what is the role of identity and uh, um, pragmatic factors there? How these identity and pragmatic uh, considerations are revealed there? And then we have uh, conservation the next uh, thing that Foucault addresses. And conservation has basically to do with the continuity of these discourses and how they change over time. And then we can look at the continuity of the discourses starting from the, the beginning of the 21st century, because we have done the overview of um, the existing data, starting from the, uh, as I said, from the Eastern enlargement period. So how these discourses have changed and how various events affected the change of these discourses. And then we have the memory. So uh, what about uh, particular discourses? Which ones are considered valid or invalid, foreign or imposed, and why? And what is the role of pragmatic identity factors in depicting certain discourses as valid or invalid? And then we have reactivation. So what happens currently? What, what's the state of the arts? How particular discourses are reactivated or how they are just lost and never, never uh, recalled, let's say. And finally, uh, a very important thing that is a part of the fifth element in the Foucauldian framework is appropriation, which has to do with various actors that operate uh, with these discourses and how they these actors uh, let's say, circulate uh, uh, various discourses, how they manipulate with particular discourses, and what is the role of pragmatic identity factors in, uh, in these manipulations, let's say. So uh, basically, critical discourse analysis looks at the power, control, and manipulation. And discourses can never actually be neutral. They always uh, provide certain stance or certain issues. And that's very important when we when it comes to Europeanization discourses, whether it's pro-EU or anti-EU, whether it's EU enthusiastic or EU skeptical, whether it's, let's say, in some cases we say it's uh, Euro-optimistic or Euro-critical, it's still certain stance. And we do try to reveal uh, how this, uh, um, discourses are structured and then uh, uh, circulated among the public and how they, uh, let's say, predict the further um, course of the European project and Europeanization. And when it comes like very briefly to important words in the very end, um, here, basically, we deal with the, let's say, agenda setting uh, phase, what is done, what is said. And if we want to also look at the technical details of how it is said, or let's say do with framing, within this Foucauldian framework, we also adopt the critical discourse analysis frameworks developed by contemporary analysts. And we uh, here integrate three levels, which is macro level, by Norman Farrakhlo, uh, the meso level uh, by um, Ruth Waddock, and the micro level by Toyn Van Dyke, who 
provide, let's say, particular strategies or instruments how to reveal these discourses and how to critically analyze these discourses. And uh, we, after this wider picture of agenda sucking, we will move to the a stage of framing and look at these particular stages and the application uh, uh, in these discourses in the seven target countries. Uh, so, for example, top voice strategy is very important. And I see already how it works in the case of Georgia. We can look at the ideology schema so, uh, offered by uh, Toyn Van Dyke and how the various aspects of ideology schema work in case of our analysis. We can look at recontextualization, intertextuality, and so on. I won't go into detail right now because we do not really have time but that's I, I basically actually, what we are going to do i actually think that one podcast is not enough uh, to cover such a topic uh, it's a complex topic uh, even though we have received uh, training uh, from you actually on that uh, specific topic it's quite challenging so i can imagine that the 15 20 minute podcast for our audience won't be enough but uh, uh, for those who will listen to our podcast, uh, we just wanted to let you know that uh, this podcast discussion will be released uh, with uh, the second, uh, uh, within the second newsletter of our Mediatized EU project. Uh, that will be done before uh, Christmas. Uh, uh, and uh, it will also contain a few useful links uh, uh, that can explain a bit more in detail about what uh, uh, Dr. Chuladze just mentioned. Uh, with that, I think that uh, we have uh, uh, reached uh, to the end uh, uh, of our podcast discussion. I would like to take the opportunity to thank you uh, for being at least virtually available and here with us, uh, Lika, and for sharing your views and uh, uh, comments, especially for explaining in simple terms the theoretical framework and the methodological approach. Uh, that was the Mediatized EU podcast series with Moara Crivelente and Andreas Marazis. Stay tuned for more news and updates in the upcoming podcast discussions. And don't forget to follow us on social media and visit our website for more information and updates. Thank you very much.